Hello everyone, welcome to a new episode of Reflections with an Accent. My name is Kike Calvo, photographer and entrepreneur. Today we're going to be talking about Salmon. Our guest is a wildlife photographer, an author, and is a founding fellow of the International League of Conservation Photographers. You probably have seen her work on outdoor photographer, Audubon, National Wildlife, Sierra, or Smithsonian, just to mention a few. I just want to uh, welcome Amy Gulick. Hello, Amy. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure uh, to have you here. Uh, so let's have fun and let's talk about uh, conservation, salmon, photography, and, and everything in, in between. So I would like to ask a very simple question is why salmon? Why do we need to care? Why do you chose salmon? Why? Well, I, I guess I'll start by saying maybe that's not such a simple question. Um, but I, you know, for me- Really? <laughs> there's a lot to salmon, I will say, but I- I, guess I know, I know. <laughs> I, I, was just, I was just teasing you, but uh, yes, I just want to know why. Well, for me, um, there's something about salmon that, that forces me to take a look at my own life and the time that I get to spend on this earth and makes me think about my own journey, uh, what I'm doing with my life. Um, salmon, salmon really kind of forces us to look at ourselves and, and, I'll, and I'll explain why they do that or I, I think why they do that. So Pacific uh, I, salmon. So, sorry to interrupt. Can you get closer to the computer because I can hear some echo, and I think once you get a little closer, it improves. That's perfect. Ah, okay. Yeah. Is that yeah. Better? Much better. Yeah. All right. Then you can just see my face really large. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, Pacific salmon. Uh, so their life cycle for those who may not be familiar with these. Uh, remarkable creatures. So they are born in fresh water streams and rivers. And then uh, after they hatch and they grow a little bit to get to be about this big, then they head out to the ocean uh, to mature because that's where they're going to find uh, all the food that they need to grow into adults. And then uh, at some point in their life cycle, they leave the ocean and they head back uh, to the very birth streams and rivers uh, where they were born. And so most of us, if we are around salmon, we're very likely we're going to see them kind of when they're in their prime. So kind of in the ocean, when they are you know, at, the, at the largest they're going to get, that's when we catch them and when we eat them in general. Um, so we're going to see them then, like in, in kind of, again, their prime, or we're going to see them at the very end of their lives when they're entering uh, their birth streams because what they're doing now is they're going to enter the birth streams, they stop eating, and they're going to spawn the next generation and then they die. That's their life cycle. So, a lot of the times we're seeing them at the very, very end of their lives. And that's the part where, if you spend enough time on salmon streams, watching salmon spawn, watching them take their last gas, you know, their bodies in decaying, you know, sometimes their eyeballs have been poked out by ravens or eagles or gulls um, and they're still going like they're still trying to swim upstream um, and that's very that's very interesting actually i have created like a small simple presentation so you can talk over some of the images uh, but first uh, everybody that's out there were completely live so if anybody wants to ask a question but I like to play a game, right? Um, uh, and it's the game of words. So I'm going to give you a word, and I want you to answer the first thought, experience, memory that goes through your head. Uh, not with uh, just one single word. You can explain that if it was, what is that memory or, or, or that experience you, you want to share. So the first um, word that I have for you, and everybody gets different words. I don't know why I came with this game, but uh, if I say sushi, uh, as in Japanese sushi. Right. Uh, culture. Okay. Okay. You want to say something else about sushi, about salmon, or should I go 
No, no really. Not, not so much. That, that's the sushi is a culture that I'm not very familiar with. Okay, okay. What about if I say uh, farm salmon? Uh, that's easy for me. Farm salmon, I would say very destructive. Uh, farm salmon uh, in general, uh, not a good idea <laughs> um, to eat. Um, and the way that they're, I will say this, the way that farm salmon are grown and produced um, is pretty unhealthy uh, to the environment. It's unhealthy to the wild salmon. Um, there's a lot of disease associated with farm salmon. Um, I, you know, I, I've seen farm salmon and personally, my choice, I would never eat farm salmon. Okay, that's, that's a good answer. Fair question. I mean, third word, katmai. Uh, katmai, uh, bears. <laughs> uh, very well known for uh, grizzly bears, uh, the huge, large concentrations of grizzly bears. And that's because there's a lot of wild salmon um, that is uh, food for bears. So it's a very uh, abundant, very wild uh, place. Okay, okay. Uh, totem poles. Uh, culture, uh, endurance, strength, uh, stories. Um, so many uh, Northwest Coast uh, indigenous people, uh, the totem poles that they carve, uh, that is a huge part of their culture. Uh, the totem poles tell stories, and they usually tell stories about uh, a family, their clans, uh, maybe an event that happened. Um, they're kind of mysterious to those of us who are not indigenous and that's not a part of our culture. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're, they're kind of intended to be that way uh, to outsiders. We're not necessarily supposed to understand the story. So when I look at totem poles, uh, I feel just an incredible strength uh, and, and power and, and one of endurance too, because these cultures have been carving these poles since time immemorial. Yeah, I'm sure they're very beautiful. Uh, Yukon River. Uh, the Yukon, uh, wow, uh, just immense, immense. The Yukon is I think it's the third longest river in North America, 2,000 miles long. Um, something that just blows me away with the Yukon River and the salmon in the Yukon. So the king salmon, there are five different species of Pacific salmon, uh, and they have king salmon that's one of them which is the largest species um half the king salmon that spawn in the yukon river travel all the way to the headwaters to do it so you've got those salmon entering fresh water they've stopped eating and now they're going to go 2,000 miles without food just to spawn the next generation and die so yeah. it's pretty amazing yeah it's pretty pretty wild and if I say uh, salmon running, or the salmon are running? Uh, to me, that just, just brings so much joy uh, to my heart. Because when the salmon are running, that means things are working like they should. The ecosystem's functioning, uh, bears are going to get fed, eagles, ravens, uh, the forests are going to get nourished uh, with, with salmon nutrients. Um, it's a great time of year when the salmon are running. All right, all right. So, um, Amy, because I know you know uh, more about salmon than myself. So, what do salmon need to be living in healthy populations? You know, in the freshwater streams to spawn, um, the oceans to mature, all that migration. What, what do they really need um, to be healthy and happy? <laughs> Yeah, salmon are one of those species that they need it all. They need everything. And that's, it's what makes them an indicator species. So again, part of their life cycle is spent in fresh water. So they're, they're born in fresh water. So they absolutely need rivers and streams to be clean, um, you know, healthy, uh, no pollution, um, trees and other vegetation on the riverbank to stabilize the stream. So that whole freshwater environment has to be uh, healthy. And then a big part of their life cycle is spent in the ocean. This is where they grow into adults. So that ocean has to be 
uh, healthy. It has to have enough food. It's got to be the right temperature. Uh, same with the fresh water. Uh, water temperature is crucial for salmon because they're cold blooded creatures. So they depend on the water temperature of their environment to regulate uh, their bodies. Uh, and they like cold water. We do not like warm water. So fresh water has to be healthy. Ocean's got to be healthy. And then they need estuary. And the estuaries are kind of that in between. That's where the fresh water empties into the ocean and uh, it's kind of brackish water. And this mm -hmm. is where the salmon can spend some time acclimating because their body has to go through this unbelievable transformation to go from fresh water to salt water and then back from salt water to fresh water. So they need it all. They need fresh water, they need the estuaries, and they need the ocean. All right, so as I said, I have prepared a simple presentation, so I'm gonna show some photographs and keep on asking you questions, or you can refer to the images. Hopefully it's gonna work, you never know with technology. So uh, so this is the, uh, the cover of, of one of your books, right? Yes. Now you can hear, see yourself. And um, so what, what are we looking at here, Amy? Uh, can you explain a little bit? I have other questions I'm going to be asking, but I just want to go through the visuals because it's more fun and, and people appreciate to see what you do. Sure. What are we looking uh, at? So this is a, a brown bear, also known as a grizzly bear. And this bear has just caught a female chum salmon. So again, there's five species of Pacific salmon on the west coast of North America. There is a sixth species uh, on the other side of the Pacific. But over here, there's five species. So this is uh, what's called a chum salmon. It's a female. Um, what I love about this image is it, it's beautiful and it's tragic at the same time. So this female salmon, again, was hatched in this stream, you know, as the little egg, um, you know, grew to be a little, you know, fish, left its birth stream, went to the ocean, ate a lot of food, spent a few years in the ocean, grew to this adult size, and now it's left the ocean, it's coming back to its birth stream, and it's trying to spawn the next generation, meaning it's going to lay its eggs, the male will come in and fertilize it, and then it will die. Um, that's kind of the whole mission, you know, uh, in, in their lives at the end of their life. And so against all odds, this female salmon has survived all those stages of her life. And now she's coming back and, and she's just about getting ready to get to her spawning grounds and lay her eggs and this brown hair, you know, captures her and and it's yeah it's kind, of a, it's, a, it's kind of a, a sweet sour moment my daughter was just looking at the photograph when i was mounting this and she was she reacted to it and i was explaining some of these concepts you're saying like wow really i can't believe it like yeah so it's it's a combination of happiness right. for one but also nature you know right, and, right. but and, but and the maybe, beautiful yeah. part the beautiful part of this for me of this whole story and i like to call uh the salmon life cycle it's 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 a hero's journey you know in, in many respects the beautiful part of this i mean it, it's sad that she didn't get to pass on her eggs and her genes to the next generation but the second that this bear caught her her life force was then transferred to his and, no. and this is kind of the ultimate sacrifice, I think, that salmon make. You know, they feed so many other species, including ourselves, and they drive the entire ecosystem that they're a part of. Um, so that, that's the beautiful part to me of this, mm. of this image and this whole story of salmon fly. And uh, would you say that Alaska is one of the world's last places where we have, like, running wild salmon would you see would you say it's one of those last places on earth for that oh definitely uh, alaska is the last best wild place in north america um, by far for pacific wild salmon there are other places on the other side of the pacific um, in russia uh, that mm. still have uh, healthy wild runs but that's pretty much it have you had the chance to visit uh, that part of Russia or most of your work has been in Alaska? Uh, most of my work has been in Alaska. I'm very intrigued though by uh, an area in Russia called the Kamchatka Peninsula yeah, runs there are very prolific. So 
someday I'd love to go. So, so what would you say? And obviously, this it's a very simple uh, answer, I guess. But why? Why would Alaska be one of those um, wild places for for salmon? Um, I just want you to explain a little bit because remember we have people watching from everywhere around the world or Colombia or Ecuador and they will never go to Alaska or they haven't been yet. So it's like a different planet for them. So uh, if you can give me some explanations, why, why is so unique about Alaska that makes all this possible? Yeah, well, Alaska still has what salmon need. You know, we talked earlier, you know, what does salmon need to thrive? You know, they need to get healthy streams, rivers, they need a thriving ocean. Alaska still has all of that. Now, where Pacific salmon used to be prolific, south of Alaska, on the west coast of North America, um, in Washington State, Oregon, Northern California, um, we've, we've lost what salmon need. Uh, we don't have healthy habitat for them. We don't have healthy stream and river systems, uh, very few anymore. We've, we've put dams on the rivers so the salmon can't get to their spawning grounds. Uh, we've logged along uh, freshwater streams and rivers. So a lot of silts and pollution goes into those streams. Uh, we're mining, we're dumping toxic chemicals, you know, into their birthing streams. Um, we've, just, we've just destroyed a lot of habitat where they used to be, but Alaska still has it. So that's, okay. that's the that's good news for them. Okay, and, and uh, let me show a little more of, of your work. Um, how would you describe the uh, current situation of humans with salmon? Not particularly in Alaska. Right now I'm talking in, in general, like based on your experiences and research, what is that relationship today in your opinion? Mm -hmm. Well, where salmon thrive, people thrive too. Uh, that's that's this beautiful connection because where salmon are thriving, that means the streams are in good shape, the ocean is in good shape. You know, salmon have what they need, and so for people who live with salmon and have a relationship with salmon, um, it's a it's a very beautiful connection uh, that they have, not just with the fish, but where the fish live. And uh, many different there are many different types of relationships that people have with salmon. Uh, they're indigenous people uh, whose mm -hmm. entire cultures uh, have been built on and revolve around salmon. Uh, they're commercial fishermen uh, who catch salmon, sell them for their livelihood. Uh, they're sport fishermen you know, who catch them more for recreation and, and guide other people uh, to do the same. And as long as those uh, populations are abundant and healthy, there's a certain number of salmon that we can catch and we can remove from the ecosystem and uh, the ecosystem still okay and the salmon populations are still okay. So that- but, but would, you, would you say, Amy, sorry that I interrupt, but would you say that salmon populations are declining in Alaska? Is that a reality today? Uh, it, it depends, you know, Alaska's immense. It's a very, very large uh, area and there are different parts of the state where salmon are. And it really depends kind of on each river system as to how the salmon populations are doing. Um, there's an area called Bristol Bay, which is, mm -hmm. has half the world's um, sockeye salmon um, populations. That part of Alaska is doing very well, uh, salmon populations are. But there are other areas that aren't doing so well. So the Yukon River that we talked about earlier, um, salmon populations there are fine. Um, mm. for reasons not entirely understood. Um, there are other parts of Alaska where certain species are in decline of salmon. Uh, salmon are very complex, um, I'll, I'll just say that. So I, I can't give you a simple answer and just say all salmon are doing great or all salmon are not. It's, uh, it depends on the system. But there are areas yeah, where they're doing well and are areas where, where they're not. Yeah, obviously, it's, it, it was more of, of a, a, a question in general, so people understood. And what are we looking at on, on this beautiful photograph, which is very, uh, very artsy, uh, but also tells a story? What, what is this? What are yeah. we looking at? This is how salmon start their life. So okay. these are the fertilized eggs 
and uh, they're just developing. So the little dark spots that you see in the center, that's a salmon eye. And if you kind of look closer in each egg, you can kind of see you know, the rest of the head, maybe a little bit of the body. But at this stage, they're called eyed eggs. Okay, very, very beautiful, very graphic photograph with, with that powerful orange. And can you explain our audience how do you take this photograph? What gear do you use? What is the, what is the setup behind the, this, this moment in particular? Yeah, this was, uh, this was a bit challenging to make this. So at this stage of their lives, we would never see this in the wild because okay. those, eggs, those eggs would be in a stream, and they'd be buried beneath gravel. So they're in what's called a red, which is another word for nest. Um, so we'd never see this, but I thought that this was really crucial that people do see this stage. So I was able to go to a salmon hatchery and hatcheries um, are raising salmon uh, in like little trays <laughs> and they raise them until a certain age and then they release the fish uh, uh, into the wild. So I was able to go into the hatchery and um, photograph the salmon using a very uh, specialized lens in, because they're tiny. I mean, those eggs are no bigger than your thumbnail. So I was able to use uh -huh. a specialized lens to magnify so we could, we could see them. Okay, very, very beautiful, very graphic photograph. Let's see what, what did I chose next? I don't remember. So uh, this one. So this is another, another one that I thought it was very beautiful. So what is happening here? What are we looking at? Yeah, great progression from the last one. So this is the next phase in their life cycle. So when the salmon hatch from the egg, this is what they look like. Again, we would never see this in the wild uh, because they'd still be buried uh, uh, beneath the gravel in their in their birth streams. Um, and what's super interesting and I think just beautiful about this, so you can see like you know the thin salmon body, and attached uh -huh. to the body is the yolk from the egg. And mm. Up to a certain point, that yolk is feeding them. They're, they're still relying on the nutrients from the yolk. So we like to call it a, a, a built-in lunch bag <laughs> uh -huh. uh, because it's, it's, it's giving them the nutrients they need at that stage. And then eventually they grow a little bit more and then that whole uh, yolk of that egg gets absorbed uh, into their bodies. And then they really start to look like a little baby fish. Hmm. And visually is very, very aesthetic. There's, there's light sources from behind and also uh, uh, from the front. So it looks, it looks quite, quite interesting and beautiful to, to look at. And, and I, I, before you explain these photographs that are coming, um, would you say that, that salmon is overfished in certain places in Alaska? Could we venture into saying that? Um, you know, Alaska has done a remarkable job um, because they learned from their neighbors down south who did overfish and did pollute and did put dams in the rivers and substituted hatcheries for habitat. Those are really the four main causes of salmon decline elsewhere. Um, you know, Alaska took a look at that and said, okay, we don't want to repeat those mistakes. And so we're going to do our, the best job that we can, knowing what we know about salmon. There's still a lot we don't know about salmon. But knowing what we know, we're going to try very hard not to overfish. So, so what is that magic number and what's that balance? You know, how, mm. how many fish can we take and not decrease the populations? Um, you know, people might argue with me that uh, in some parts of Alaska, um, yeah, salmon has been overfished in the past, certainly. Um, but I would say they're doing a better job than, than anywhere else as far as trying to uh, manage that. And, and Amy, what would you say that is being done uh, to restore that decline that is happening in some places, you know? Um, as you say, they learn from all the lessons from their uh, down south neighbor. What is being done differently that you saw yeah. and you would like to share with us? Yeah, well, if I mean, if there is a decline or if the runs are coming in and they're not very strong and, and the salmon aren't 
uh, you know, leaving the ocean and heading up to their spawning grounds in the in the streams and the rivers in the number that we'd like to see, like a sustainable level, then you stop fishing. It's like, mm -hmm. it's that simple. <laughs> you just stop fishing until of course. enough salmon get past, you know, that gateway in between ocean and, and fresh water and they get up into their spawning ground. That's kind of the whole, it's more complicated than that, but that's the whole goal behind managing salmon. You want to let enough salmon escape, they call it escapement, escape mm -hmm. getting caught uh, so they can get up to their spawning grounds and produce more salmon. Okay, so find, finding that balance. And, uh, and can you tell us a little more uh, about these photographs that I was showing here? And here, uh, or even this one, what, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so you're seeing what has been going on since time immemorial uh, with indigenous people in Alaska um, who live in salmon uh, country and um, it, their entire cultures uh, have been built uh, and revolve around salmon. And what's so beautiful about this time of year is that families gather uh, multiple generations are all helping to catch, cut, clean, smoke, mm -hmm. uh, preserve uh, the fish. And they're teaching the next generations uh, how to do this. And it's just a wonderful time of year. And I think it says it all in her face. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And for those who love photography, so this was done with like a slow shutter speed and, and a flash. So that's, you see that ghosty image in her hands uh, showing that portrait in motion, but still is sharp uh, on all the facial expression and it's, it's, it's quite a nice capture. And you were, you were talking about uh, the different species of salmon. Would you mind sharing with us which are those species um, in, in Alaska, for example? Let's not venture sure. into the other location. Let's talk about Alaska in particular. <laughs> right, and I'll, I'll give you the common names. And, and to yeah. complicate things further, each species has two common names. <laughs> All right. But I, I, yeah, again, salmon are complicated. But um, yeah, so the five species are king salmon. That's the largest. Uh, there's chum, there's silver, pink, and sockeye. Um, so the other names, so king is also known as chinook, um, chum is known as dog salmon, uh, sockeye is known as red, uh, pink is known as humpy, and silver is known as coho. Okay, all right. <laughs> There's actually, there's an easy way. There's an easy way to remember. Um, okay, which one is like that? This. You have to use your hand. So okay. Me, there we go. <laughs> Trying to get it right in the camera there. So thumb is chum. Uh, your index finger is uh, poke you in the eyes, sockeye. Uh, middle finger is the largest, so that's the king salmon. Your ring finger, think of ring and silver. And then your pinky, pink salmon. So thumb is chum, index is sockeye. Uh, this one's king, the largest. Ring finger is silver, pinky is pink salmon. So if you get okay. those, then you can work on the other common names. Okay, that's a, <laughs> that's a good technique. Once I stop, I, I look at the video again, so I, I'm able to finally learn the, name, <laughs> the names. And uh, <laughs> when we go to like uh, the market, in general, um, to buy salmon, what would you say uh, people should look for? Um, I know there's many variables and things, but in your opinion, uh, what people should look for? Yeah, all right. So this is my personal opinion. The first thing I look for, is it wild salmon or is it farmed salmon? And me personally, I'm never going to buy farm salmon, kind of for all the reasons we talked about earlier. Um, if it's wild salmon, I next thing I'm going to look for is where is it from? Um, and how is it caught, if they know that? And uh, I always wanted to know who caught it. 
<laughs> we can't always know these things, but farm or wild for me, that's huge. And I'm only going to buy uh, wild. And, and here's why. I mean, not only are farm salmon harmful to the environment, they're harmful to uh, wild salmon populations. And I'm going to argue that they're not very good for us, given that the way they're raised. But the other thing with choosing wild salmon, if there's no demand for wild salmon, then there's absolutely no incentive for us to maintain their habitat and maintain what they need. And so this is crucial. But then, but and then a lot of people, it's kind of, it's sort of counterintuitive because a lot of people think, well, I want to save wild salmon, so I'm not going to eat them. Uh, but again, this is a product that does end up in grocery stores and in restaurants. And if we demand wild, then we're also saying we really want that habitat to be mm -hmm. maintained and we want the salmon to be maintained sustainably. So that, that's the hope uh, is that we're not going to overfish them. We're going to manage them in a sustainable way. And then we get to enjoy them because they're incredibly delicious and healthy source. Uh, food. Okay, w wonderful answer, Amy. And um, so I, I like these interviews um, as an excuse to know the person behind the work, right? So I want to ask you, um, what did you learn from your biggest failure in life? Wow. Um, simple, you know, another, I... sim another simple <laughs> question, you know, you know, all my questions are always very simple. Uh, you, you know, not just my biggest failure, but I think any failure, really. I think what I have learned over the years is to view failures. I don't even really like that word, be, but to view them as learning experiences and teachable moments. So if yeah, something absolutely. When I when I meant uh, failure was a way to describe it, the positive outcome from that, whatever sad or unexpected moment, yes. Sure, so, you know, if something doesn't go the way I want it to go, if I can pause and take a breath and kind of step back and say, okay, what can I do different? You know, what can I try again? Um, you know, what, what needs to happen in order to, you know, get the outcome that I'm, that I'm looking for? And maybe, and maybe it doesn't happen. And that's okay too. I mean, that's that's a learning experience. That's a teachable moment. So, yeah, I always, you know, the word failure and mistake. I always like to just call them teachable moments, learning experiences. Absolutely, I, I agree with you on on that one. And and if you had to choose uh, the biggest lesson you learn in what you do, what would that be? If you had, oh. if you had to go with one. There are so many, but, um, you know, for me, you know, ph photographing and telling stories, I mean, that's what I do. Um, follow your passion. Uh, if you're not passionate about something, it's kind of hard to jump out of bed in the morning <laughs> and give it 100%, you know. So yeah. if you're passionate, it's, wow. Like you will want to get out of bed, you will jump out of bed. You'll, you know, there won't be enough hours in your day, you know, to to do what you want to do and and, and pursue that path. So, whether it's photography, storytelling, whatever it is that you're doing, um, you just follow your passion because because that's what the world needs, right? The world needs passionate Absolutely. people doing good things. So, and it's and it's quite interesting, Amy, because here on the channel we've been having. You know, artists, scientists, uh, anthropologists, and I, and there's there's something in common, and and they all have this passion and this drive about life, and curiosity, and that curiosity sometimes, as I, I we saw the other day on on my interviews with some musicians, it's about piano or guitar, and other times it's salmon or it's anthropology or even prehistoric painting. So. If you lack that passion, I don't think you will get very far in life and you won't be very happy either. So I think that's part of the existential mix that is so important. And, and the other thing that I want to ask you is, um, when did something click internally in your case in particular? So you created that 
link between photography and, and conservation because uh, some young photographers they they just obsessed with producing beautiful um, beautiful images beautiful visuals but they don't tell a story because they're, they're lacking uh, science they're lacking whatever they're lacking but what's your position about this and when did that happen in your particular case mm. you know it happened pretty quickly uh i i for me the more time i spend photographing what i'm passionate about and what i'm passionate about are wild places you know, functioning ecosystems uh, wildlife you know people who have relationships uh with, with those things the more time you spend in places like that, you you just can't help but not only falling in love, you know, with these places, but you start feeling what it means to be human, what it means to be a part of the world, what it means to just be, and you also start seeing the threats. Um, to these places, to these ecosystems, to these beautiful relationships that humans have with wild places. And when you start seeing the threats, um, I just feel like me personally, it's, it's my duty, it's my responsibility to make other people aware of these threats. And hopefully um, we can uh, make sure that, you know, salmon streams stay intact, the ocean is livable, uh, the planet is habitable uh, for for all of us. So it, it was a quick connection uh, for me to start using my work uh, for conservation and to educate a much broader audience because that's what we need. We need a much broader audience paying attention uh, to these places, to these species uh, that affect all of us, no matter where we live in the world. Absolutely. And uh, let me go back a couple of photographs here. Um, I had this question. Uh, it's a little bit not connected with what you're saying right now, but I don't want to forget about it. Uh, photographing all these um, people doing what they've done for generations, is there a particular way of cutting s salmon? Is there something that you have observed that they do? that the rest of mortar, mortals they don't do? Is, is, is that something that you've seen? You know, or is, what's, or is you that know, a what's beautiful? Question? Yeah, because yeah, I've, I've, I've seen market. Simple. Okay, I, I've seen markets in Colombia that they cut fish in ways that I never seen anywhere else in the world. And that's why I was asking this naive question, like have you seen something in particular they do that is different from the rest? Um, yeah, I, again, like, like salmon, there's nothing simple. Um, every culture has their own way, has their own style. It's kind of whatever has worked for them. A lot of it has to do with the species itself. So mm -hmm. if you're, if you're cutting king salmon, that's the biggest salmon. And the whole idea behind cutting and, and, and this, and this, uh, image. She's uh, hanging salmon strips in her smokehouse to dry. And mm -hmm. so if you're cutting king salmon, those are the biggest fish. So how do you cut those in a way where the salmon is going to dry evenly um, and, and rather quickly? I mean, quickly is kind of relative, um, but it just depends. So if you've got a smaller fish, maybe you're going to cut it in a different way than a bigger fish. But also, I've actually seen um, uh, just different cultures maybe cutting the same species of fish in a different way. That's I think a lot of it is just how you were taught, um, what kind of tool you're using. There are different types of knives I've seen people use. Uh, one is, um, uh, I think it's in one of the images that you have called the, an ulu or an uluwak, and that's a, it's a very curved blade uh, uh -huh. that you hold like this. So that may dictate how you're going to cut there. She's got one. Yeah, she's got. One yeah, you can see that on the. Uh, yeah, behind. Yeah, Be behind, behind my head. Right. <laughs> right there. <laughs> right. But other people use like a long skinny knife. It, it, it just kind of depends. But I, I was absolutely fascinated. If I do another book on salmon, I'd love to just like, you know, highlight all the different cutting styles uh, that yeah. people have because they're they're very different. And a lot of it also depends on the climate. So 
in mm -hmm. parts of Alaska, it's very wet. It's a rainforest. It's cold. Um, salmon would never dry without a lot of smoke uh, in that climate. And then further north in Alaska, it's much drier. And so people really don't need smoke. Um, so they can they can cut the salmon in a different way than going to just air dry its own. So it, it's again, it, it's cultural preference, it's climate, it's size, it's the species. Um, again, no, no simple answer, but a lot okay. of <laughs> and, and Amy, I know you've been in, in some of the most magical places in in Alaska. Uh, what would you say the, these, all these places have in common? Um, is there certain characteristics that you've seen in all of them, or are they so different that they, there's nothing in common that you would describe? I, you know, each, each ecosystem where salmon is can, can be pretty different, uh, but what they all have in common is they're healthy ecosystems. You know, the, the rivers and the streams are, are clean, they're cool, uh, they're complex, which is salmon need that. Uh, the ocean, the estuary, where they're, you know, passing through to get to the ocean um, is, is cool, uh, has enough food. Um, so they're wild, they're functioning, healthy functioning ecosystems, functioning as they have thousands in thousands of years, um, that's and 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 because of that, they're they're abundant. They're abundant with life, and salmon drive that whole ecosystem. So when the salmon are spawning, they're coming back, you know, to their birth streams. You've got bears coming down to all the salmon streams, eagles, gulls, ravens, um, people. Uh, it's 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 a really abundant, uh, very concentrated time of year when those salmon are spawning. And there's nothing like it, you know, to, to watch sure. all the life, you know, going on all around you. It's, it's I've and never what, really what, felt more alive. That's wonderful to listen. What are we looking at here? Uh, my, my head might be covering a portion, <laughs> but uh, uh, what, what are we looking at? Uh, well, just as long as your head isn't about to be gobbled up by a bear, I think we're we're okay here. So uh -huh. this this image tells an incredible story, um, and, and so the uh, my, which was documented in my first book. And my first book is called Salmon in the Trees, and it refers to this incredible uh, ecological connection between the forests and salmon in a certain part of Alaska, and it's called the Tongass National Forest. And so uh, in this part, in, in that book, you were basically analyzing the ecological connection between salmon and forest, right? That's kind of like the essence of that book. Is that, is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And the reason why it's called salmon in the trees is because there really are salmon in the trees. So the way this works and people are like, what, you know, what, what, do, you, what do you mean by that? And it's like the way this works. And this is another great illustration of this. So at, when those salmon are coming back to their spawning streams, they've left the ocean. There's all these hungry bears, especially in this part of Alaska, waiting for them. So the bears often grab a salmon from the water and they take it on the land into the forest. And a lot of times they're just taking a bite because they're really going for the healthiest, fattiest parts of that fish. They leave the rest behind, but all of these nutrients from the body get uh, absorbed uh, through uh, the soil and, and then get taken up through the roots of trees. Now, scientists have actually been able to uh, take tree core samples from these very large trees right along salmon streams, and they've analyzed them. And what they found inside these trees is a really, really high concentration of a nitrogen variant. It's called nitrogen 15, and it comes from the ocean. And the only okay. way that, that variant, that ocean nutrient got there was through the bodies of salmon. Um, wow. So that is pretty remarkable to me that, you know, in the, in the bark, in the needles, in the leaves, in the berries of all that vegetation surrounding the salmon streams, there are salmon. That's in so interesting. You know, I never thought I would be talking an hour about salmon, but I can continue because <laughs> it's, 
it's, it's quite interesting. And, and looking at this circular eye here and, and connecting with somebody, something else uh, in connection with your life, if you had to start everything over again, um, would you do something different in your career um, now that you have mature, uh, looking back, is there things you wish you knew uh, or, or, or you're happy with, with your venture in life, your journey? That, that's a great question. And I, I think it's a question that we can only, I think, answer in a, in a, in a way with wisdom. I think once we've hit a certain age. Um, so looking back now, I can see that there was a path that I was following, but mm -hmm. I didn't know it. I didn't know it at the time. I was just kind of, oh, I'm gonna do this and then I'm gonna do that. And then this led to that, but it wasn't, I didn't like set out this path. It just, one thing led to another. Um, and but I can see now how all those dots and all those events in my life have led me to where I am now. And mm -hmm. so, if that's what it took for me to be where I am now, I wouldn't yes. change a thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it seems that the path we all follow is kind of uncertain as, as you experience it. And once you get there, many things fall in life, in, in, in place. Um, I think I, I told you that I had my second daughter recently, three months ago. Her name is Luna. And... Uh, and as time passes, there's many things in my career that I didn't quite understand why I was so obsessed with them or why I was working on certain skills. And suddenly, boom, they all fall in, in the right place at the right time. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. Like, uh, I would not do things differently if, if that was the main way of coming to where I am today. And talking about technology, is there any particular piece of technology uh, that you cannot live without and, and, and why and, and why, what is that? Hmm. <laughs> There's, you know, it, it's interesting. That, that's an interesting question, because, especially now, right? Because we're using technology more than we ever have probably in, in humankind, you know, even in our history you know, of human time. Um, so I, I can point to many things, I think, but I, if I had to pick one that would be hard to live without, at least now in my life, it would just be a watch. Okay. <laughs> it's really helpful for me to know what time it is and uh, how long something might take me, and how much time I have to get from one place to the next. When is the sun setting? When is the tide going out? When's the tide coming in? Um, I just say a lot. <laughs> okay, you know, it's, it's interesting because different people have different uh, answers. So it's quite, uh, uh, quite interesting to listen. And if you had to share with us, what is the best piece of advice ever been given to you? What would that be? Mm, wow, there's there's a lot of them, but I I think if I had to, I mean we can we can expand now. we can ex <laughs> we can expand Amy to three wonderful advices you've been given in life. Uh, well, one okay, one for sure. Uh, follow your passion. Um, uh, there's so many people that you might encounter in life that are going to steer you away from your passions. You know, they're going to say, you need to do this, you need to follow this because that will help you support yourself. That's all good advice. I mean, I, I'm not, practical advice is always helpful, but follow your passions. Don't let anybody squash your dreams because that's when we all just kind of are watching the clock and, you know, waiting to die. <laughs> But let, let me let me tell you a story, Amy. Like uh, this is a real story. When I was a like a, a younger aspiring photographer, I I went to probably one of the few photo galleries in my country in Spain uh, that happened to be in my hometown. And when I approached the owner, uh, basically he completely discouraged me, saying that I had no connections and that was almost impossible that I would make it in this industry. 
Uh, can you believe that? And then we oh, were both. Oh yeah, I can. We were we were both invited to be on an interview in television, and I rejected because I said if I sat with that character face to face, I would bring that story because it was very traumatic for me, and uh, and I never understood. Like now that I'm a professional, I always encourage people to reach their maximum potential. So I just don't understand why a high end professional will give that type of advice to like an upcoming professional, you know, like who is he or whoever to decide what the future will bring. So, uh, yeah, yep. that's something that I always remember. Yeah, that's a good story. And I've had similar things happen to me when I was uh, starting out too. And, and it is discouraging, especially when you're speaking out you know, those who've been in your field yep. much longer than you have. Absolutely. And, and, you're, and you're looking, and yes, yes, we're all looking for, you know, constructive criticism, but I'm also looking for encouragement. And yeah, uh, and you don't always find it. And I, I would say more often than not, you don't. And so when you do find people who are willing to mentor you or provide advice or provide some guidance, take, oh my gosh, latch on to those people. and. And now that I'm at a certain point where I am and I have younger people approaching me, I, I always go out of my way to make time to talk with people and answer their questions and do my very best to encourage them and, and, and encourage, inspire them to follow their passions. It, it is hard. I mean, it's a hard path. This is not an easy way to make a living at all. Um, yeah. So it, 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 is, it is very difficult and I, um, you know, I'm always honest with younger people about that. But at the same time, I always say, if this is your passion, find a way. You will find a way. Absolutely. And, and talking to the younger audience that may bump into this video in the future, if you find that mentor or that person that shares an honest opinion or an advice, always be, be grateful. You know, like I think it's a Chinese expression uh, be thankful to to the fountain that gives you water uh, uh, because sometimes people forget so it's not mandatory for someone to be nice to someone but if they are um, you know people also value not the recognition but the gratitude you know just being thankful to whoever came first and lend a hand or open a door uh, I think that's uh, that's like the circle that interconnects all these things and we're coming to to an end amy but uh, i just want to look a couple of more more photos what are we looking at uh, here i'm randomly going to be showing you and if you want to describe them they're all images from amy's book so i encourage everybody to to look for them they're very beautiful way well, i have one of them and it's really beautiful so i'm <laughs> assuming that the other one is as beautiful uh what what, what are we looking at <laughs> Uh, so this is a very um, healthy, abundant um, uh, area in Alaska, healthy and abundant for salmon. This is uh, Bristol Bay. And again, this is uh, home to half the world's sockeye salmon uh, fishery. Um, it's a super intense, concentrated time of year in Bristol Bay. There are on average, 33 million fish, uh, sockeye wow. fish, return every single year. This year, double that is expected, over double. 75 are predicted to return. Wow. Uh, all those fish come in about 20 days, just 20 days. So yeah. commercial fishermen who are, and that's what these are. These are commercial fishing boats. They've got 20 days to, to like catch enough fish to really make you know, their livelihood, a significant part of their livelihood. Uh, indigenous people have about 20 days, you know, to harvest and put up enough fish to get them through the winter. That's their winter food. Uh, and uh, sport fishermen, um, they've got a little bit longer than 20 days, um, but uh, it's a, it's a okay, crazy time of year for all of them. That's so interesting. And I assume that these images, they're from that process, right? Uh, this is like a, an aerial view, and this is a close-up view of, of the action yeah. on one of those vessels. 
Yeah. And, and and what is this that we're looking at that is quite interesting? So there's like uh, throwing those nets into the water, but also like a bear. What yeah. is this yeah. moment? Yeah. So this is just, again, to me, one of those beautiful connections uh, between nature and all of us. You know, so you've, you've got people that are harvesting salmon and they're going to, this is going to go into their freezer uh, and get them through the winter and a stone's throw away and you've got a grizzly bear that's harvesting salmon uh, that's going uh -huh. to fatten them up uh, and get them through their winter hibernation. So it's whether you're a human, whether you're a bear, it's, it's all these species coming together um, uh, and their life forces are being fed by these remarkable fish. Well, wow, so, so, so beautiful. And this is a detail of that equipment that is being used, uh, <laughs> drying outside a cabin or a house, right? Yeah, uh, rubber. <laughs> you, if you're going to be around salmon, you will be clothed in rubber. It's rubber boots, rubber gloves, rubber jacket, rubber waders. It's because you're going to, it's a lot of blood, it's a lot of guts, it's a lot of slime, scales. Um, yeah, fish or salmon are, salmon are messy, okay. <laughs> but so is life. <laughs> Abso absolutely. Uh, I love this photograph. It's kind of a, an interesting pattern that is created by those uh, shadows projected into the wood from that uh, drying salmon, right? Yes. Uh, very, very artistic and, and, and very beautiful. And what is, what, what is the, I mean, I know what it is, but like, can you explain us what are we looking at here? It's such a beautiful yeah. image. Yeah, this is a close up of a salmon tail. Um, so the, the fin part is radiating on the bottom um, and then where it attaches to the body, that's where you're seeing all those beautiful, beautiful scales. And then normally these scales are stuck all over you. If you're again, cutting salmon, if you're catching them, they're, they're kind of flying up, they're really sticky. Uh, so a lot of people don't necessarily think that they're beautiful, um, but they're absolutely gorgeous. Like each scale is like a little jewel, it's like a diamond. It's just, it's sparkle and different colors. Um, and again, it's just another thing that makes these fish so, so remarkable. So a, a very naive question uh which of these five fingers corresponds to this one amy <laughs> i'm pretty certain Re -re remember i'm gonna watch finger. i'm gonna pretty watch this whole thing finger. again that one there <laughs> okay pretty sure it's the ring finger so this is a silver salmon okay all right then i'm not gonna question that i don't have the ability <laughs> <laughs> and this is you right when, 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 when was this? Uh, this was actually, so I was working on my first book, Salmon in the Trees. Uh, my second book, The Salmon Way. Um, that's uh, the progression of those books. But this was, I was working on the first one. I really needed to get up in the air and see that forest that I was um, highlighting uh, from the air. It's really hard to get an, an idea of just how big and vast this particular part of Alaska is, unless you're photographing it from the air. I see. And uh, taking advantage of this visual behind you, uh, what advice would you give like somebody uh, starting or somebody that dreams to become a photographer or uh, use photography for conservation? What would you tell them? What would you be your piece of uh, wisdom? Uh, I mean, again, again, follow your passion for sure. Um, and you know, especially if you're wanting to use your photography for conservation, uh, there, I think there are many paths uh, that, to get into conservation um, and, and storytelling in general. Um, so don't just rely on photography uh, to tell your mm -hmm. stories. You need to be able to write. You need to be able to speak. Uh, you need yep. to be able to put together, say, a, a book or... Uh, mm -hmm. Again, a, a compelling presentation. You need to understand um, your subjects. So study science, uh, study biology, mm -hmm. uh, reach out to people in those fields. Um, scientists are often your very best friends when it comes to 
um, learning of, about your subject and getting access, you know, to these places because some of these places are not easy to get to, and maybe mm -hmm. scientists are doing work there. They've got a field station set up, and uh, oftentimes scientists really appreciate it when people come and uh, mm -hmm. you know document what they're doing and 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 tell those stories. So and, definitely, and actually, study yes, it is. Uh, like the other, I think it was before yesterday. I interviewed uh, Christina Mittermeier. That was mm -hmm. in Spanish because I, I some reflections with an accent is in English. Uh, Por los caminos del viento, which are the paths of the wind. Those are Spanish interviews, and we were talking about uh, this concept of being multidisciplinary. Like many times, people become absolutely obsessed with the camera and the f8 and the aperture mm -hmm. and and all these things, but they forget they need to be able to articulate ideas, research, write, complement with wonderful captions, interact with humans to open doors, right? Uh, so I, I think many times people have a misconception of this industry thinking, I'm gonna be by myself in the middle of the forest with no human interaction <laughs> whatsoever. But then those images, they're never going to see the light anywhere because you need other humans to grab that work and make it useful, right? Yes, absolutely. I always, I always like to say there is only one species that's going to see our images and hear our stories. Yeah. And if we can't convince that one species of the importance of our stories, then why are we doing this at all? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and Amy, and this is gonna be my, um, let me see if I have a couple of extra photos here. No, that's my last one. So um, I always finish all my communications with, with the term or the expression, never stop dreaming. That's kind of like how I sign absolutely everything uh, because I think it's a beautiful message. And I always ask all the guests to make an interpretation of those words. What would be never stop dreaming for Amy uh, Golik? Did I pronounce your last name correctly, by the way? Uh, pretty close. It's, it's hard to say. It's even hard for me to say. No, well, <laughs> how, how do you pronounce your last name? It's Gulick. Gulick? Yep. yep. Gulick? Very good. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right, then. <laughs> so what, what would Amy Gulick say about never stop dreaming? I think I'd probably say never stop dreaming that, that enough people are going around the world are going to wake up and understand that we're all connected. We're all connected to each other. We're all connected to the earth, which is the only home that we know. We're all connected to the oceans, uh, rivers, the air we breathe, the water we drink, um, glaciers, climate, um, all of it. And I, I think if the more people uh, wake up and realize that, I think more of us will be caring for the earth, uh, which is the only home that we know. And so my work, that's what I'm always trying to get people to do is just understand that we're all connected. And that we need, it doesn't matter where we live, we need all of these places and all of these parts to be functioning in a really healthy way. And in parts of the world, they're not. In parts of the world, they are. The parts of the world where they are, we need to maintain that. Parts of the world where they aren't, we need to restore and recover. And there are a lot of people doing that work. And it's hard work, uh, but it's absolutely necessary for all of us. So that would be my answer. All right, wonderful, Amy. So I just want to say thank you so much for uh, joining this humble uh, channel, uh, which takes all my creativity to fight against the algorithm. Nothing, nothing easy to do, but I'm, I'm learning a lot. I learn a lot about Salmon. Uh, I'm glad that I, you know, discover, discover a little more of what you do. And, and especially, I just want to thank you for for taking the time to, to be with me today. Oh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. I hope we'll, we'll, we'll meet soon. So with, with this, 
I just want to say, everybody, thank you so much for joining a new episode of Reflections with an Accent. And remember to never stop dreaming. Thank you.